Uh, four present and three are away on personal business. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, uh, there's no public meetings for planning applications this morning. Um, we do have some presentation, no presentations at 11. This takes us right to departments of staff reports. So we'll start with planning and economic development business. On page one, we have PED PD 37 218 contract extension of the mapping and graphic technologists. It's my understanding this is helping to with our comprehensive bylaws. We're trying to bring forward our old three bylaws that we have for the city of Nanticoke, town of Haldeman, and the town of Dunville. And it's been a little more uh, challenging uh, when they discovered what was all involved. So, uh, Mike, do you want to comment on this, or who's going to speak on uh, on this report? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you, you've captured it accurately. Uh, on the, the, the mapping side of things, it's proven to be uh, a lot more complicated than we had anticipated. Um, in bringing together the three zoning bylaws, there's been a an immense amount of cleanup that we had to do uh, on uh, on a lot of the maps. That's just um, historical uh, issues, you know, from from moving from one uh, um, one mapping file type to another over um, over the 16 years uh, that we've uh, we've been working with these zoning bylaws. So there's been a lot more uh, line work, cleanup, et cetera, that uh, that we've had to undertake. Uh, and, and really, we need to get this right. Uh, so we're we're putting a lot of attention into those details uh, and ultimately what uh, this extension would allow us to do is, is to carry on with the program uh, we're, we're confident that this is uh, this is the uh, extent of the uh, additional time that we require uh, to get the work done uh, the text piece is 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 ahead of, of the mapping piece we're uh, about 85 percent complete on the text portion uh, so really what that looks like is uh, um, the definitions, the general provisions, and the zones. So we've articulated all of those, and now it's taking that information and, and really um, telling the story through the mapping. And that's what this is uh, um, uh, asking uh, council to uh, uh, to consider is, is to allow for that mapping piece to continue and allow us to wrap up the document. Sure. And when this is all done and, 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 and finalized, it'll be much easier for the public and for staff to, to uh, have one bylaw for the county as opposed to dealing with three sometimes there's contractors working in the city of nanticoke they move to town of haldeman and they're under different bylaws for building and stuff so it will be much easier for the public and staff when this is completed is that correct uh, to you mr chair that's 100 percent accurate uh there'll be consistency across the board um in terms of uh provisions so for example uh, an r1 uh, resident one uh, zone will have the same provisions in, in the hamlet of Nanticoke um, as it will in the urban area of Caledon and the urban area of Dunville type of thing and then all points in between. Uh, further to that on the mapping side of things, uh, information will, uh, will be current because uh, it will be uh, an online tool uh, that uh, GNS, GIS enabled online um, a mapping resource uh, that will be refreshed uh, as bylaws become declared or site specific amendments become declared. So you will have at your fingertips current information uh, and you'll also be able to drill down on properties in terms of what are the zoning provisions relating to this property and then are there any site specific bylaws that, that tie to this property. You'll be able to link right out to those site specific bylaws and find all the information you need right there on the screen. Oh, excellent. Sounds great. Okay. Any other questions or clarification of this report? Councillor Corbett? Yeah, with regard to this information coming forward <coughs> that we're going to continue with the technologist. I have to ask with regard to the public input that we can expect for our zoning bylaw project. How will this engagement talk form and uh, are there going to be certain periods of time where the public can comment because are there some issues out there that they want to deal with? Uh, through the chair, uh, we've we've had two rounds of public consultation to date. Uh, there's more public consultation to come. So once we have the uh, the complete draft of of the bylaw, and that would include um, mapping that we can uh, we can demonstrate to the public, 
uh, will be going out again um, and certainly council would receive notification of, of when that is uh, and we'll be sharing information uh, with the public at that time in terms of some of the, the, the changes that have taken place, um, how it impacts property, uh, how, the, how the new tools will, uh, will work and how they can interact and work with them. So there is still opportunity absolutely for additional public input because um, there, uh, there is the need for, uh, for an additional public uh, information center to take place. And then post or after that takes place, um, we would come back for a, a public meeting of, uh, of council and committee to present the, uh, the final document. And that, that's a public meeting in and of itself. So there's, there's opportunity for discussion yet at that stage. But usually when you get to that point, you've addressed the, the, the majority of the public input uh, and, and presented the, the, um, the responses um, to what that input has been or how we've interacted with that input. Thank you. Good. Maybe just to you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, it was interesting on, uh, with respect to this. We met with a company from Syracuse, New York about uh, two weeks ago and sat down with them and they were trying to explain where they were from in Syracuse and, and they were looking at doing development in the uh, Lake Erie Industrial Park um, with rail. And they knew from our website all of the planning applications, requirements, and things that were required. And the fellows uh, said to us at that time, he said, it's one of the very few places that he's been able to go on to their site and actually see all the things that were required. And Mike and, uh, and, uh, and the gentleman, he was a, he, a planner by trade as well, were able to have a fulsome conversation through it, which I thought was quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, from all we hear about what's on the website, what's not on the website, um, this gentleman who was uh, you know, a planner from the U.S. Uh, and, and Mike were able to have a, f a fulsome discussion based on what he had picked up off the website currently, and it's only going to get better from that. Excellent. Councilor Corbett. Yeah, just to remember, too, we have a lot of people who don't, do not have the Internet and can access that, so hopefully in the future uh, we're working towards that Internet system in the county. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Any other questions or clarifications? Seeing none, can I have a mover for this report? Councilor Corbett, seconding Councilor Delmani. All those in favor? That's carried. That takes us to page four, PED COM 19218, Sir Frederick Haldeman portrait donation. And just to give you a bit of a background, there was uh, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Bill Warnick. He's the president of the Port Maitland uh, on the Grand Historical Association. And um, he came to our council during this past year about the idea of uh, providing uh, a portrait of Sir Frederick Haldeman. And he thought it would be good for us to have and put up at, at our disposal at no cost. Um, in our new admin building. So um, I wanted to thank Bill for his uh, efforts and his group. And uh, we have the recommendation here today that the report PEDC 0M19218 Sir Frederick Haldeman portrait donation be received. And that the offer by Port Maitland on the Grand Historical Association to donate a commission portrait of Sir Frederick Haldeman to Haldeman County be accepted and that the donation from the Port Maitland on the Grand Historical Association be on a without restriction basis, and that the cost of framing be allocated to the approved Central Admin Building capital budget. Any questions or clarifications? Seeing none, can I move her? Mary Hewitt, second, Councillor Corbett. All those in favor? That's carried. I have to ask the clerk, because I'm kind of pinch hitting for uh, Mr. Morrison today. Is there anything under other business? I don't believe there are there two items. There was one that you wanted to raise about development in Dunville, but that I think that Tyson is going to be under so public works. We can do that under public works. And I think uh, <laughs> Councillor Del Monte wanted to raise an item about uh, cannabis mm -hmm. production. But I thought we were going to maybe talk about that new business because it's a bigger issue. You thought I think there's been some it was going to be raised under other business because it will ultimately uh, result in a notice of motion at council. Yeah, so. As, as opposed to being under new business today. Okay. So Councillor Del Monte can speak to that yeah. now. Uh, now. Okay, excellent. Okay, thanks, Very good, Councillor Del Monte. My concern is the, um, 
In regards to the the new grow ops that some of them established, some of them in the process of, of being established, and the um, the concerns that I'm hearing from the public, and you know, for the moment, I'll speak about my ward only. Um, I know I have a couple in the works. One specifically on Indiana Road, and I received uh, not during, just during the election, but before the election, I received a lot of concern uh, about. Uh, the control that the municipality has over uh, these potential sites and the ability of the ratepayers to protect themselves, the ability of count this council to protect them. And as we find out, you know, the planning regulations are, uh, are set out uh, as they would be with any other agricultural use. And then that kind of limits, you know, how, how we can protect those potential uh, neighbors that are surrounding these sites. I think we need to go further. I think we need to to, uh, to do everything we can uh, to protect the residents that live in proximity to these potential sites. So I spoke to planning staff yesterday about it, and and of course people out there are, are you know, reading the media reports about what's happening in some of these other locations, and those are some of them are issues that we can't necessarily control here at the county. Some of them tend to be policing issues, security. Uh, those type of things which we have no control over other than to report and work with the OPP. But I'm getting at the land use issues, setbacks, um, lighting, um, entrance, egress from these properties, um, uh, the wear and tear that they may possibly create on, on roads, the condition of the roads, the ability of those roads to be able to handle increased traffic. Those are the kind of things that, that I'm concerned about. So after speaking to staff, I think what I'm going to do, Mr. Chair, is bring forward a notice of motion next Monday night that speaks specifically to the setbacks, and I'll look to staff to help me with any other criteria that they think that we could put in that motion that offers some greater degree of protection for the residents living around those sites. And that's my concern. Yeah. No, I, I, I echo your comments. I know. Uh, the ward I represent, there's a couple <clears throat> that are up and running, and some of the concerns have been about the, uh, well, kind of the obnoxious smell also. Then I don't really know what you can, like, I know myself, I grew up some farming background where you can't tell me chicken manure and pig manure is any better than the other smell. But um, I do know smell is a concern, and like you mentioned, maybe the minimum setbacks that agriculture has, whether it can be applied for these, I don't know. Um, with the buildings already up because I know there's a few in my area where they're already up they haven't started operation but they're in, in construction and uh, some are doing some harvesting I believe I did want to mr. chair I did want to ask a question to the staff though is so if I was to bring forward this notice of motion on Monday night and ter in terms of timing on a report back to council can you talk to us here this morning about when when you see a potential report coming back to council that would address setbacks and seeing as how the press is here this morning, can you? Because I'm getting calls already on the retail issue. Uh, I've, I've got a gentleman that's interested in a facility in downtown Hagersville. I, I can't give him any information other than what's come out of the province. But can you talk about the retail side as well and what you see in terms of the timing on reports coming back to council for, for decisions to be made? Sure. Mike, you go ahead. <coughs> uh, through the chair, uh, on, the, uh, on the retail side, um, We'll be bringing a report forward uh, to December Council and Committee um, as it relates to the, uh, uh, the province's um, requirement for municipalities to decide whether they're opting in or opting out. Uh, so we'll be bringing that forward. Uh, so uh, uh, Council will need to make a decision um, prior to January 22nd, hence that's why we're bringing it forward uh, to December uh, on whether or not to, to opt in or opt out. What that means simply is uh, um, if you opt in, uh, you, uh, you become a municipality that is a host to the retail uh, facilities, uh, which would be regulated by the province. Uh, if you opt out, uh, then the province would not permit any of those facilities to be located within your jurisdiction. Um, so uh, I, I'll leave it to that and we'll unpack it in more detail when we bring it forward in December. Uh, and as part of that same report, we're envisioning um, uh, introducing uh, what regulations for the, um, the cannabis production facilities could look like. Uh, and then also outlining the, um, uh, the public input process for that as part of that report. Um, 
from there, uh, we're, we're into the new early part of the new year to, uh, to bring uh, zoning provisions forward for, for consideration uh, by committee. It would uh, likely be, um, I don't want to overcommit, but it'll be the, uh, within the, the first several months of, uh, of the new year that uh, we'd likely be in a position to, uh, to bring forward uh, uh, regulations for, uh, for implementation, because uh, we do have to go through a public uh, consultation process. But what you'll see in December, again, is, is a two-part report, the opt-in, opt-out decision on the retail side of things, uh, and then some draft um, regulations, uh, the, kind of the, the, the thought process behind those uh, and, and what they would ultimately uh, serve to address um, uh, as it relates to the production facilities. Okay, good. Thanks for that. Did you have a, Councillor Corbett, did you have another question? Uh, Mike covered uh, some of my concerns, the opt-in, uh, opt-out option that we have. I want more information on it, uh, and I know that uh, we've been working on, and I, I hope you've reached out to Norfolk County because they passed a similar bylaw. And I've already received uh, questions with regard to opening uh, retail outlets, so there are people interested if that's the route we choose. Very good. Anything else? Any other comments? All right. Well. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to Mayor Hewitt. <clears throat> and you'll have to take that. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Chair? Oh, that's good luck today. I guess so. I'm uh, not sure. There's an extra chair there on the back. That was awesome. <laughs> Have you just dragged it over there? We'll, we'll check at lunch. <laughs> oh. Your chair didn't make it through the election? No. <laughs> <laughs> that shuffle got lost on the river. <coughs> Motions of consent, uh, page 14. So move. Councillor Corbett, seconded. Councillor Delamonte. Questions on the uh, five items? Five items? Seeing none. All those in favor? That's carried unanimously. <clears throat> Thank you. And I'm the chair. Oh, no. Councillor Corbett is the chair, right? Thank you. Uh, page 47, budget amendment, uh, leachate hauling. Or did I get ahead of myself? Yeah. Nope, you're right. All right. Uh, do I have a mover for the motion? Moved by and a seconder. Any questions on the leachate hauling? I got a question. Go ahead. So this is an ongoing um, item i guess my question it, it's more to do with uh the at how as opposed to cambro right at leachate as far as the um amendment uh through the chair it's uh basically to uh, extend the extend the contract so we went through a tender process and um to carry on hauling so um we were um over budget and um We've uh, had discussions with staff at Norfolk, and uh, we don't anticipate any issues, but it's a two-part process where it has to be approved by both Holloman and Norfolk, and uh, uh, it'll go to Norfolk's council, uh, upcoming council meeting as well for yeah. approval. And just for the public, their knowledge, even though this, this dump site is closed, we still have responsibility for this leach aid for numbers of years going forward through the chair that's correct okay further questions if not those in favor motion is carried unanimously under other items of business i put forward a, a uh, request that staff comment on how our construction year is going uh through the chair um i can just give a quick update on some of the the bigger projects that are going on now. Um, 
One of the, the biggest ones we have going on, actually, and it's been one that's gone uh, really smoothly, is the Alder Street uh, West reconstruction. Um, so that one, they're up to, um, they've got all the underground infrastructure in place. They've poured curbs. They're working on the sidewalk. And the latest update I heard is um, they're supposed to be pouring the base asphalt on Thursday. Um, it is this time of year, everything is sort of weather dependent. I know we're supposed to get rain tomorrow, but um, hopefully Thursday or Friday they'll have the base coat on and uh, they'll just continue on from there. And then the, for the residents out there, the intent is to finish all the concrete work, do the landscaping, get everything all done, and then pour the top coat at the very end. Um, the other projects going on with the granular conversion program, that was um, the conversions were all finished uh, quite a while ago in August. Um, they are doing still some touch-up work with driveways and other things on the, the sections we've converted. They are still doing some ditching and culvert work as part of prepping the roads for next year. So um, for people to remember, it's always a two or three year process for the granular conversion. So you may see work done on the road, but it doesn't necessarily mean to be converted that year. It'll probably be the next year that it'd be converted. So um, that one's wrapping up the work. Um, there is some concrete work um, and to be done uh, out here in front of the admin building. So the same contractor that's doing the Canberra work is doing this one and there's some sidewalk um, sections in Dunville. So they do have their concrete sub in the county and the schedule that I saw um, a couple days ago shows them just staying in the county with their contractor but moving around. I understand today they're out in Canberra and then they'll be back here today uh, or uh, tomorrow the next day to start uh, taking the curbs out on the other side here. Um, and the bridge projects uh, were all completed a while ago. Um, so kind of at a high level, that's kind of where we are. It's just kind of there's some smaller wrap-up kind of work and uh, with concrete work primarily. Thank you. Do you want to explain why uh, we have rain delays, how that affects laying asphalt? Um, through the chair, uh, rain delays are a normal part of any contract. Um, they typically, they won't pave um, when it's raining. One of the big reasons being that they put a uh, tack coat down between the coats of asphalt. So if you've seen them, ever seen them um, spraying that oil on between the coats before they pave, that bonds the two courses together. And if it's raining, it'll simply disperse that and you won't get that bond and you can actually get like, it's almost like two sheets of paper. You can get the asphalt pulling apart. So if you see them, if it's a light drizzle and warm, they may do it sometimes, but typically with rain, they'll shut down. And it's also the other big issue is the safety issue as well for the workers. If it's raining and you're dealing with traffic and, and those other types of things, it can be a real hazard to the workers. So that's another reason why they typically do not work in the rain. Other questions? Go ahead. I think uh, other business. I think Tyson was going to update on the West Quadrant. Yeah. So, so for the West Quadrant, our plan was always to do the get the do the study of that sort of feasibility study and determine how much the servicing would be in the fall. Um, we're a little bit behind on it, but do it, we do have a consultant on board, so it's in our court now just to get them all the information. But they've indicated it won't take too long to complete. Um, so our intent is to get that done by mid-December and have it wrapped up by the end of the year so that if there are implications or council wishes to do something in the budget, they'll have that information and have time to digest it and look at it before going into the, the um, budget process. Yeah, well, that's good. I appreciate that because I do know in Dumble right now there's a, 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 there's a call for serviceable lands and uh, almost all the serviceable lots have been used and developed. So uh, I'm hearing it a fair bit in my other hat that I wear. And uh, so I just wanted to know where we're at. Thank you. Thank you for there. And I'll pass it on to uh, Joint Services, Tony. I have no other business listed than Joint Services. And 
not chair who, who the vice chair of community service. Neither the chair or the vice chair are here, so it falls to the mayor. <clears throat> There's nothing under community services, was there? No. So under uh, corporate services, page 49. Uh, Your Worship, could we maybe start at item three? Our uh, staff for items one and two are on their way, but they'll be momentarily okay. here. So if we could start with item three. On okay. Item three, the f user fees and charges update for 2019, page 62. Is there a, just as it's written on page 62, yes. I need a mover and a seconder for that. Councillor Corbett, seconded. Councillor Galmani. Questions, Councilor Corbett? In some of these events, like the, uh, or items like the pool or the, uh, am I on the right one? Pool or the arena, <clears throat> how much are we subsidizing? What is our subsidization rate towards these services? <clears throat> that was on the other one here. <laughs> I'm emotions. Uh, three Sorry. Your Worship, um, there was a, a significant update to all the user fees uh, uh, in that area for arenas, pools, recreation. Uh, we did change some of those uh, approved subsidized levels. You'll, we'll see in the attachment one, we have the uh, approved council subsidized license levels, but, and we've tried to maintain those as best as they can, but you really call, particularly with the arenas, we did uh, reduce some of those fees to try to increase user uh, participation in those areas uh, so you know although it says it's around 40 percent uh, that is a, approximately what the uh, uh, subsidization level is at the arena specifically um, unfortunately Craig's not here but he could speak to it in more detail okay Craig um, page 71 of your agenda what I was <laughs> gonna suggest it's on page 71 right it has the chart in which those are the approved council uh, subsidy levels Thank you. <laughs> so, so since the question was asked, it's 61% yeah. is being subsidized with respect to arenas. That's correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Approximately. Approximately. Anything further on that report? All those in favor? That's carried four to zero. <clears throat> Number four. OPP billing estimate, page 108. <clears throat> Mover and a seconder, Councilor Shurton. Seconded, Councilor Corbett. Questions? Councilor Corbett. Yeah, I'd just like Karen to explain in terms of the OPP service. We had quite a discussion. We had a discussion on what we actually pay for and actually get. And I think for calls for service or service provision is at 75% and probably the number of uh, officers that are available would show something like we, we have so many, but we only have 49 available for services. So I wonder if uh, Karen could comment on that, please. Uh, through the mayor, uh, um, Councillor Corbett's correct. At the last police services board meeting, uh, we had a great discussion on the OPP billing methodology and the service levels. This report is dealing with the billing, and what often gets confused is how that relates to um, police officers that are located here in Haldeman County. There will be, on your next December agenda, a memo that gets into that in a little more detail. That was at the request of the Police Services Board to outline what the staffing numbers are for this detachment and how, if at all, those can be measured and uh, compared to service level. So that'll be on the December agenda. Uh, essentially what it says is that the OPP have an authorized uniform strength of 70 FTE for Haldeman County. So that would include your detachment commander, your staff sergeant, your sergeants, and your frontline constables. So there's an authorized strength of 70, but that doesn't mean that 70 uh, officers will always be here and deployed. Some will be on leaves, some will be on uh, secondments. Uh, there will be vacancies due to turnover of positions. So that memo in the December uh, agenda 
outlines a number of questions that the county and the board presented to the OPP uh, a year or two ago, and we got their responses this summer, and it explains the difference between the authorized strength and the actual boots on the ground approach. So really, I think what, what is the issue for the board and for council moving forward is to have uh, discussions with the OPP and understanding of when there are resource challenges, what can be done about that. Um, every OPP detachment is dealing with vacancies, dealing with turnover, uh, dealing with secondment, but what you'll see both in that response and in this report <clears throat> is that there is a challenge uh, of having the uniform members available to deal with calls for service. And if I can speak to this report quickly, what it shows is calls for service provincially are going up. So more of the OPP resources are being directed to that reactive uh, approach to policing, not the proactive, not the speed enforcement initiatives, the visibility initiatives that the public expects and council and the board want to see. They're really dealing with responding to calls and uh, that's where a bigger portion of our bill is, is being directed to. Uh, but that's the same as every detachment in the province. So uh, this report, the challenge for council and the board is that this report is set on a formula that is applied to all OPP police municipalities and it really doesn't matter how many officers are here in the detachment. This report is, is a calculated, uh, is showing the calculated uh, apportionment of our share of about a $410 million uh, municipal policing bill across Ontario. So this is how it works. And the challenge, as I said, is to <clears throat> marry that with the number of police that are here in the county. And they really, they're related, but they, they don't go like this. You can't make them equal. Sure. Um, this is a little off this topic, but it's something to do with the OPP. And it's something that I heard, to me it makes some sense. I've been by the OPP building and there seems to be a lot of cars in the parking lot of OPPs. Is it potential that we can have some of those cars with no drivers set in certain areas where the speeding is a problem just to give the presence that a police officer is there to slow up traffic? Is that a possibility? Or is that something we have to Mayor, ask? Mayor, I think that's something that, that should be directed to the, the through the police th services board as a question to the detachment commander. Okay. Well, I don't know if you have any more meetings, but to me, if those some of those cars can be deployed in certain areas and sat there for eight hours or six hours, I don't know. I think it may, it may help in, in slowing up traffic. Send, Possibility. Send, send an email to the chair and it'll be brought up at the next meeting. Okay, I that? can do that. Thank I think you. I know the chair. Do okay. Any other questions? <laughs> Just a comment. It's, it's a good uh, discussion, but as you know, we have no control over operational. Okay. I'll drive the cars. All in favor? That's scary. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> you want to go back to one now? Okay. Yeah, we can do that. So, page one. Where are we? 49. 49. 49, page 49. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Corbett's moving it, seconded. <clears throat> Councillor Shurton. Questions on this uh, report? Just more. It's tidying up, but. Yeah, uh, just more housekeeping. Is that what my understanding is? Okay. Okay. Anything else? No. No. I just that's what I thought when I read it. I just wanted to verify that with staff Cleaning here. Up, cleaning up some stuff. All those in favor? That's carried four to zero. Thanks, Thank you. Number two. Number two. Page fifty-two. The general insurance renewal and mover. Councillor Delamani, seconded. Councillor Sheridan. Questions on that report, Karen? 
Uh, uh, just to comment, Your Worship, I just want to thank Dana McLean for the, the work on this renewal. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of legwork that has to go into validating the data on our insurable assets. And uh, she looks at uh, the amounts of buildings, equipment, fleet, uh, everything that's insurable from a property perspective, reviews values, updates it, and uh, works with the insurer to make sure our coverage is complete. So she spends a tremendous amount of time and effort to, to get our program to where it is today. And if there's any questions on the report, uh, Dane is here to answer them. Okay, so I have Councillor Shirt, or sorry, Corbett first. Yeah, sure. Yeah. If I may, I know uh, our insurance is going up. How does that compare to the industry in general? Are we seeing an increase? Has it a lot to do with all the major events we've had across the North America, or is there a number of issues out of hand here? Uh, currently, our rates for the coming year actually are very good, um, considering the things that we are seeing around the world, um, insurable events, uh, catastrophes, for example, are um, very prominent right now. So our rates are very stable, given those circumstances. Um, I don't have a lot of data with regards to how other municipalities renewals are at this point simply because we are one of those municipalities that try to get our rates um, very early before the term um, renews and so right now is the time when most municipalities are seeing their renewal terms. They're all kind of going through the same process that we've just been through um, for a lot of the terms that are renewing on January the 1st. So I don't, I'm not hearing a lot of people um, <clears throat> indicating that they're seeing huge rate jump increases. Uh, however, that will be something that I notice developing over the next couple of months as the renewals are coming in for most municipalities. Thank you. We're ahead on some things, eh? <laughs> That's true. Aaron? Yeah. Um, just to build on what Dana said, if, if you turn to page 59 of your agenda, I think this is where the crux of, of our renewal is shown is our rates did not change for most of the policy coverage. If you look at page 59, you'll see that we have nine, I think nine different co lines of coverage and the rates did not change for most of those. Where it did change is where we have more assets to insure or a different value. So more newer vehicles, uh, more properties where the value's higher. So the underlying rates that calculate the premium did not change. So we were flatlined. Our only increase is due to um, a higher value of insurable <coughs> risk. Um, these rates as well that result in this premium of, of about $400,000 uh, for those around the table a number of years ago will remember our, our uh, premiums got as high I think as $1.6 million um, before we renewed um, wi or before we went out to RFP and uh, found new coverage, new underwriters. But part of that reason why our premiums went down so much is we self-insure more of the risk. So in particular, it's important council understands that first line, the general liability line, where our, our premium is only $76,000, but that's to insure for lawsuits against the municipality where people feel uh, our actions or our lack of action has caused them a loss. And that's where you get into the uh, the uh, claims for slips and falls, for motor vehicle accidents, for the big risk issues. And we're only paying a $76,000 premium. And part of that, and that's extremely low. Uh, our policy before that premium, I believe, alone was around 600000 for that risk. Um, so the reason it's low is A, the efforts that staff are making to risk management to minimize claims, but also because we do self-insure that first quarter million of any claim, which means uh, where we're not paying an external insurer the premium, we're now self-insuring and setting our own money aside in reserve. So that makes it challenging to compare us to other municipalities. Very few municipalities our size 
have that level of self-insured risk. Most have transferred that on to the underwriter, and so their premiums are going to be higher. So it's very. We've tried in the past to make comparisons. Our neighbors, Norfolk, I believe, still have a much lower uh, deductible, which means they're paying more to their insurer. So you can't easily find the comparisons. But this is a really good renewal for us. The premium rate has been frozen, held the same. We haven't had any claims go to our external provider on the uh, on the liability policy. So uh, but again, congratulations to staff for doing a great job at managing this program. Mm -hmm. Council Sheridan? Yeah, through the mayor. I'm um, Dana. I, I believe since I've been here, we've had two requests for proposals to go out and have our insurance to get uh, tendering for it. What, what triggers that? Like, where are we at? Like, are we good for a year or two? Or who makes the call whether or not to send this out for a, an RFP? Well, with regards to the contract, um, if in the background, you'll, in, uh, you'll notice that I've indicated we went out for RFP um, in 2016. In yeah. And at that time, the, the term of the contract is for five years with five additional one-year uh, okay. renewal options. And that is always, of course, uh, subject to council's approval of the renewal figures. Okay. So when I bring this report annually, um, if for some reason council didn't feel that we were receiving a, a good deal with regards to the insurance company that we're with, um, we could always be instructed to go out back out to request for proposal yeah. to obtain a different program or see what other programs are available. Um, but generally, we try to adhere to the contract um, and, and do it on the Okay. Basis. Well, that's good. And then also, I know Karen mentioned about we kind of uh, self um, sure. insure, and that number. I know it's it's not a number we pick out of the sky, but like, how do we balance whether that number is too high or too low? Like, do do we have numbers now because we've been doing this for a few years that we look at this and say, okay, does this still make sense, or should we self insure a little more or a little less? Like. How does does that your department come forward with those ideas to recommend we stay the same for self-insuring amount? Yeah, absolutely. So we would look at if we started to see a trend where we were incurring a lot more claims that were exceeding that deductible, um, we might look at reducing our deductible. However, that would increase our premium. Premium. So we have to, it's a balancing act, obviously, to see where our dollars are best spent. And if we're seeing a lot of claims that are below the deductible, or not as many claims that are below the deductible, and we're not paying those deductible dollars, then we're saving those those funds as opposed to paying them out in premiums. Yeah, and like so you said, we haven't had many this year, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. So, Karen, my question is more related to the choices that we made internally. And maybe if we can have a high level number what when councillor morrison came to staff eight years ago with the idea of making some of these decisions i'd like to be able to see had we followed path a which the path was what we were currently on versus path b the one we're on now um, recognizing the deductible but being able to show what the you know the savings were to the county over that period of time. I think that's more important than being able to measure against other counties, because as you say, every policy is unique and different, but we could have went down the current path we were on, or we could have made the decision we did. And I think it's, it'd be, it, it would be to our advantage to be able to demonstrate to the public that this was the, right, the true savings. This was the value in this decision. And this is why we're currently on that path and we'll stay on that path. Yeah. Uh, Your Worship, we can put some numbers together that go be uh, back further in time, which is when we had the lower deductible and we were insured with uh, a different provider and paid the higher premium. Uh, so we can put that together. What's important to, in that analysis is not then to just look at the premium savings that you pay you no longer are paying outside but what have you absorbed inside so we'd need to look at the insurance reserve yep. because by not paying the external we're now paying more so yep. to balance that oh, yeah, we no, need no, both. I, yeah. but yeah, yeah fair, good to have the a fair and a true number i think yep. is, is one that we we should have and yep. could have we can we can we can expand on the background because we only went as far back as when we increased <coughs> the deductible so council we'll, 
Um, we'll take. We'll talk about how quick that can be done. <laughs> I think it should be. Uh, if it's nothing fancy that you need, we should nothing, be able to do it. I think a very high. I don't yes, think a we very should be, detailed we should report, be, we but we will just a high level report it. that that can be able to say, here's where we were, here's where we are. Yeah. 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 I think I think what you're getting at, Mr. Mayor, is that you're looking at a fourteen thousand dollar increase on insurance going in, in here, and you've been saving four hundred thousand dollars a year potentially over this time. And so over those years, you're talking about you know two million, three million dollars in savings from the two different options. And so we'll let the numbers play out because we've put less money away or more money away into the accounts um, over that time, but we've also lowered the deductibles. So let the number play out and where it is, but I think it's very important that we maintain that large sort of high picture of this so we don't get caught in the minutia of, yeah. hey, let's change, let's go in a direction when in fact the decision that the council made and staff uh, brought forward actually is being beneficial as well on top of this and in, in, in I see the general manager smiling is we put a lot of different things into this I mean this was the roads needs study that we do on an ongoing basis that evaluates all the roads in the county and on our liabilities to read so there's a lot of things that go into reducing our exposure and the amount of money 13 million dollars that the council's put into road rehabilitation in the in the capital budget at 25 million you're spending 13 million on roads and so all those are kind of contribute to the reduction in your insurance, right, sure. at the end of the day? Okay. I'd also like to mention, too, that in doing that kind of calculation, if you're going back and using historical figures of the deductibles that we are the uh, premiums we were paying for the municipal liability, if we had a lower deductible at that time and we were submitting more claims, that premium was likely to probably be increasing incrementally over the years if we were submitting complaints to, com if we were sitting submitting claims to the insurance company. So I'm not sure that it will be a, a true um, indication of what those figures would actually be had we stayed on course A. As no, and I, I agree and I think I, I don't think you'll ever get it to the exact number but I think you can you can Make do a, a rough calc that can say if we were to insure these these costs that would have a, an incremental increase that you can calculate versus we're self-insuring so there is still that cost so you can offset the two but like i guess say I, we're not looking for an exact Back amount science yeah. but i i do think it's important for the public to appreciate that yeah there's an increase here but that increase has been mitigated by you know some adjustments that we've made in the policy that that are resulting in significant savings for sure we can put something yeah. together okay. all in Good. favor all in favor yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm voting twice here okay you got a string <laughs> yeah, let's carry it four to zero thanks dana last one is uh 148 alternative service delivery location memorandum memorandum of understanding councillor corbett seconded councillor del monte questions none all in favor? That's carried four to zero. <coughs> Page 178 is. Uh, oh, I think oh. we have other business under corporate services. Councillor Corbett wanted to raise an item. Okay, Councillor Corbett. Thank you. I know with regard to the election and the voters list, when people phoned Evelyn's uh, office, they were helped quite a bit and I thank you for that but it begs the question what has gone on with our voters list it doesn't capture all the people that they uh, have to continue to phone and I think we went through this the last election and to the documentation you have to provide it's very difficult for a senior who does not have a driver's license to, to ensure that they are able to vote. And unfortunately, it has disenfranchised some people. So I don't know what can be done with regard to the voters list and what can, documentation. I've had people come in with their uh, visa and they, they couldn't get on the voters list. They couldn't vote. They had to have some other documentation is there any way that we can smooth it out for them to vote in the next election the voters list uh, people that were residents for years found their name was not there and i wonder what's going on is it totally driven by when you 
fill out your income tax, that information is passed down, and if you don't document that, you're not on the voters list. I don't know what's going on, but I'd like to see some change because I spent a good deal of time on the telephone trying to direct people. So, Councillor Corbett, I, I do certainly understand people's frustration uh, with uh, the voters list. Um, it's important to remember that each level of government has their own um, voters list. So when you're filling out your income tax form, you're giving your uh, consent to be added to the federal and I think potentially the provincial voters lists. But those are two separate ongoing lists. The list that's used for municipal elections is provided to each municipality prior to each election by MPAC. And so it's, it's completely based on the information and the data that MPAC has in its database. Now that relates to property ownership, tenancy. They do certainly, uh, staff are currently in the process of updating all the information that we received over the last several months and weeks and that will be provided to MPAC, and MPAC should be using that information to update their database. But it has certainly been recognized across the province that this is not the ideal solution. Uh, many, many, many municipalities have difficulty with the quality of the voters list and the information that's provided to populate that list. There is a working group that's been working at the provincial level for a couple of years now to see if there's an alternative to this because right now the legislation requires that it come from MPAC. I've just seen some things coming across online this week to suggest there may be a move to see if there's an alternative of piggybacking onto the provincial voters list. That being said, it's as it stands right now, it's all the information comes from MPAC. Now, staff internally are going to look at ways that we can potentially um, monitor the database that we have on hand and um, adjust for any changes that we are aware of as a municipality. We do ongoing monitoring um, to take off any of the deaths that are registered through our division here so at least we're recognizing those change, uh, changes and we're going to look at other ways to potentially um, keep up to date with what database we have on hand and compare it to what MPAC sends us four years from now or three and a half years from now so we are certainly going to look at those um, it is a concern that is heard across the province from municipalities, the quality of the list. In terms of identification, the identification that's required to vote has to uh, illustrate your name and your qualifying address. In most cases, for most people, the driver's license is the most handy and easiest piece, but by no stretch of that, the imagination is that the only piece. Um, as long as it's, uh, the, the identification has your name and address on it, there's a very lengthy list that the province provides and that we have illustrated at the voting polls, on the website, uh, we, we've tried to promote that. So for instance, if you had a utility bill that was uh, provided to you with your name and address on it, that would have been acceptable as a piece of identification. So we certainly do our utmost to try and promote that information. Um, we, will, we will continue to strive to do more and better and comprehensive communication for the next election. Um, but again, that's, that's prescribed by the legislation. Thank you very much, and I know you've helped a lot of people. There are a lot of people who don't have access and don't want to get out of their municipality to get on the voters list. That's a problem, even going to the library to get on. And the other thing I can recall when the impact here was here, they raised our rates because they were going to hire more people to look after, I assume, things like this, and it hasn't proven out. So we'll keep that in mind the next time they show up. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, no. Not gonna. Should I had something, but all in favor? That's carried four to zero. Was there a motion? No. <laughs> oh, sorry. Was there a no? no. That oh, was other okay. business. That was just. That was other business. Was, yeah. Just, just yeah. Sorry. So okay. Minutes, uh, Police Services Board. Questions, comments? 
there's two sets, June and September, July, August, uh, Police Services Board did not meet. Councilor Corbett. Move. All moved. Okay, seconded. We have one motion to receive both sets. Okay. Yeah, Councilor Corbett. Councilor Shurton. All in favor? That's carried. Yeah, Thank you. Four to zero. <coughs> Any inquiries, announcements? Business. Concerns? Uh, <coughs> New business. business. And there's the addendum in the red folders with the two motions that were raised by Councillor Corbett at the uh, last council meeting. <laughs> I'm going to move both the motions. Just to so we need to deal with one at a time. So. Yeah, okay. All right. I'll second the first one and, and speak on it. So that's the one about the always stop at Concession Street and Tamarack Street. Yeah. Uh, I just, just so it's clear, I'm pretty sure Mayor Hewitt addressed this because he mentioned it also when he's out campaigning. We're going to look at all of Tamarack, correct? Because I'm not really totally in favor of this one, but I can see another stop somewhere on that road. So staff's going to look at all of Tamarack, or, or what was uh, what was their thoughts? Uh, through the chair, I mean, the direction for that one is to look at that singular spot there. I think if council wanted to look at okay. all of Tamarack, then we just, uh, you'd have to change the, uh, the resolution. Okay, or, well, the reason I'm bringing it up is I don't think this spot here is the problem. They take off from Broad Street, they come around the corner, and they fly down Tamarack. I witnessed it many times. <laughs> I think a better stop would be at Ramsey, which is about halfway, so, which would be a three-way. So whether I, we can include that, but I, I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even support this one. So before we get into doing our own traffic study, um, Councillor Corbett, uh, to your motion, would you be amenable to opening it up to the whole street and allowing staff to come back before we decide whether we support or not support it? Most is, uh, definitely that was the intent that coming forward out of our last discussion and the comments that you received from people on that particular street. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we've had uh, discussions on Ramsey Drive before, so. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll change it uh, to so amend it to include all Ramsey Drive or Tamarack Street. How do you want that word? So, um, to review. so staff be directed to report back. So this is specific to an inst yeah. the installation of an of an all-way stop. And so we're looking to review traffic along what I'm suggesting here if, yeah. if Bring it back is that, that staff be directed to report back to council and committee regarding the installation of an always stop at one or more intersections along Tamarack Street in Dunville sounds good yeah okay. Okay. for control speed measures or whatever you good with that yes yeah, I'm good Do we have too. a seconder yeah councillor Shurton okay yeah I'm good with that too you're good with that all those in favor Okay, that's 40, 40 to zero. Thank you. <clears throat> and the second motion, I don't see any changes in that. Uh, the intent is to take a look at that build up area and have some type of a speed reduction there, especially where the park is for kids crossing the road. So I move that second motion. Okay, so. Um, do we know what, 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 do you know what he means by speed reduction? Uh, through the mayor, yeah, I, I think what uh, Councillor um, Corbett is looking for is just a reduction. I think it's 80 and looking to extend the current 60 there. I'm not that's, sure. that's uh, through, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's yeah. a 50. Was that a? It's a, it's a 50 by the, by the church of the playground in Cambro. And then it, it, and when you get out of that area, it turns into an 80. So you can, are you suggesting lower than a, <coughs> generally speaking, they're 50s. 50. Well, no, but it's 50 now. I drive it every day. But I don't see the reduction in speed. So how are you gonna make it? Good? But you know, when you're, you're, coming, you're coming into Cambro, Cambro it reduces to 50. When you come into those, those that homes corner. in that square, yeah. <coughs> and so 
it does not if it's that's what it is I believe today you come in there you see the 50 coming into into that area but and that's right by that where that park is and those 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 new homes is they, yeah, about they six homes there new look at it and come back <laughs> okay if it's already 50 we're good okay so we need to sit under okay. but that's not what this says why don't can can we can we take this offline and then you and Tyson rewrite this so that it speaks to what it the intent is and bring it back to council next week? Yes. Is that That'd fair? Fine. Can we do that? Okay. So yeah. can we just um that doesn't say that. It's already fifty. So can we just uh def have a motion to defer this to council then? Okay. So you're comfortable with deferring it to council? Yes. So you'll move that? Yes. Councillor Corbett? Yep. Second to Councillor Sheridan. Then you and Tyson can kind of clean that up. Okay. And just all those in favor on that. All in favor? Control. That's carried four to zero. Thank you. Okay. Announcements? Inquiries? Councilor Del Mar. Just want to remind Council that. Uh, not this coming Saturday, but next Saturday, November the 10th, uh, at 6 o'clock at the Hagersville Community Centre, the, the uh, West Halden General Hospital is having their annual charity auction. Uh, really a, um, a really fun, entertaining night. A lot of goods and services uh, donated by the community. Uh, it's a major fundraiser for the hospital. They, they generally raise about $50,000 in one night. Um, it's great entertainment. We usually have uh, Gary Bartlett, Warren Berger, and Ed McCarthy usually do the, the auctioneering that evening. Uh, there's food and drinks available. It's usually a packed house, and I encourage anybody to come out and support your local hospital. Okay. Councillor Sheridan? Yeah, um, I also just want to bring something forward, and I'll probably bring it on council on Monday night. Uh, the Haldeman River Cats, which is the girls' hockey, play throughout the county and they play in all different arenas. Um, the midget um, B team, or double B team I guess, um, are having a support the troops um, initiative for the day and uh, admission for the, the day is free but they're going to have retired Donald uh, Kelly from Cuga who's going to be there as the honorary um, dignitary for a center ice presentation and uh, so it'd be great to have lots of people at the Cuga Arena and I believe the games are from 3 to 7 o'clock and I, I'm not sure exactly I'll have it Monday night when the uh, presentation is um, to kick that off but I do know the midget B team is going to have like uh, camouflage uh, shirts and I think they're going to try to fundraise them and maybe even sell them or keep them as a as a keepsake but uh, something to honor the troops and it's a day before Remembrance Day so the timing is very good for that so I'd like to uh, congratulate them on that initiative okay. anything else just a reminder for members of council and the public that the annual Remembrance Day service will take place at Monday night's council meeting that's good to know that's it. <clears throat> get through a lot quicker when this side's not here <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens right yeah. we gotta get one in there yeah 10 second delay we yeah, yeah. <laughs> right like this right now uh we got a motion to go into close Need a mover and a seconder that pursuant to section 239 of the municipal act as amended, council convened a meeting at 10:35 a.m. close to the public to discuss a proposed or pending acquisition of disposition of land by the municipality or local board. Uh, one PWES 19 2018 proposed land purchase at the intersection of Monsoon Street and Boyd Street in Jarvis. Uh, two PWES 20 2018 proposed land purchase for sightline triangle at the intersection of Sandusk Road and Concession 12 Walpole. Mover, Councilor Sheridan, Councilor Delamani, all in favor? That's carried four to zero. Wow. Never been included. <coughs> <coughs> I'd like to just take a couple of minutes. Yeah.